Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 51, Calling Out Disney. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my talented and insightful co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. So this, uh, I think we are all kind of in agreement, is the start of our second season. Sure. Uh, We can go with that. Our second year of podcasting since we synced up with uh, Insights into Teens. So kind of uh, a sort of exciting, (laughs) sort of exciting time. (laughs) Uh, we are recording a little off schedule, although to say that this show actually has a set schedule. Is, we keep saying we have a set schedule and we we really don't because we just kind of do it whenever it fits into Whenever things. we can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Normally we record on Saturdays with a target of recording on Thursdays, but a couple of us were under the weather this weekend, so we were recording late on a Sunday here. Right. So Super Bowl is, Sunday, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Even though you can't say Super Bowl because that's trademark. Right, but, right, right. But I just Great. said it. We just got pulled down now. Thanks. <laughs> Please, with all, uh, everything else that we, that we talk about and post. Sorry, Disney doesn't own that, so they probably won't take us down. <laughs> right, right. They don't care. <laughs> so we got a lot of Disney and Star Wars news, not a lot of entertainment news this week. Uh, we're going to talk about some Disney stars that are calling out Disney for various reasons. We will talk about, uh, an artist that is suing Disney, uh, Pixar over, um, a van. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit mm-hmm. more. Then in Star Wars news, because apparently we do so much Star Wars news, we have to have a Star Wars segment now. <laughs> well, it was like, do I put it in Disney? Do I put it in entertainment? Eh, just put it in its own See, Star time. Wars is taking over the show. It's going to be the Star Wars show soon. <laughs> right. Depends which I'm sure we'll get sued for. Right, right. Uh, so in Star Wars news, we have uh, a release date for the Disney Plus Cassian Andor uh, television show. Uh, we have a long lost Star Wars TV show that never made uh, the airwaves mm-hmm. to take a look at. Uh, and then the force is strong on this LA mansion, uh, themed basement, star Wars themed basement. And then in our entertainment news, we will talk about the crown getting clipped a season, uh, all that in our insightful picks. Are we ready to get started? Sure. All right, let's go. Go for Disney Detective. So in our first story, uh, it seems that Sebastian Stan actually now joins uh, Oscar Isaac and John Boyega in subtly uh, calling out Disney. So obviously Disney is is definitely in in their prime between, you know, the, the television and the film industry. And now they have, you know, a lot of success with Disney Plus and the parks, obviously, uh, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And obviously, you know, the last Star Wars film coming out, not really being, you know, a huge success among, you know, some of the, the past Star Wars, but obviously still... You know, they they weren't hurting, you know, it wasn't like it was a complete bomb. Uh, But it seems that not everyone is thrilled the way that Disney is developing the storylines of most of its beloved characters. Recently, Star Wars actors John Boriega and... Uh, Oscar Isaac had made headlines over voicing their disapprove, uh, disappro- uh, I can't speak today. Disappointment. Thank you. Uh, with the way that their characters were treated in the last few films, 
Um, so obviously they've been, you know, together um, since 2015 when Force Awakens uh, came out. Um, and on the set, you know, the cast definitely bonded. Um, and, you know, they got to, you know, work with, um, you know, the original cast, um, Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill, and obviously Carrie Fisher before she passed away. Uh, but with each new story, it just seemed like the characters and the actors that played them were getting more and more different disconnected uh boyega um was actually the loudest critic um who you know basically had been saying um that the force he was quoted as saying the force awakens i think was the beginning of something quite solid uh last the last jedi if i'm being honest i'd say was a bit iffy for me in the original star wars film there was so much more of a trio feel and i don't know how quickly we're going to be able to establish that long-term dynamic with episode nine he continued i do feel after three films still we still don't know as much about them as we got to know han luke and leia um and even um uh um i'm sorry and um I'm just like all over the place today. <laughs> uh, I'm really just not awake. Uh, Oscar Isaac, you know, had even said, you know, I think that there could have been a very interesting forward thinking, um, not even forward thinking, just like current thinking love story there. Um, something that hadn't quite been, you know, explored yet, yet the dynamic between the two men um, that were in war and they couldn't fall in love with each other. Um, you know, he's like, I would try and push it in that direction, but Disney overlords were not ready to do that. Right. Um, and it's funny because looking back at the films and I don't know if it was just the way that the script was, but yeah, you didn't have that that same bonding between, you know, the main characters, you know, because also you have to figure, too, that, you know, Poe was kind of off on his own for, you know, a lot of it. And Ray, you know, and Finn were together for some part of it. Like, you never had, you know, all of them together, you know, right, until right. the very end. Whereas, obviously, with Luke, Leia, and Han, they were all together together you know, almost from the beginning and, and had that, you know, that bonding. But I guess the other thing, too, is that, you know, they were looking, all right, well, now we're in a different age. Let's try pushing, you know, the boundaries. And we did see in um, Rise of Skywalker, you know, there was a character that obviously was was gay you know you got to see her hug her wife right you know at the end of the thing so you know do they i don't know i guess i'm kind of torn like okay it would be nice to be inclusive of everybody but i well, don't know if you really have to take a stand to be to be entirely honest with you the character development in this latest trilogy was so poor mm -hmm. yeah that having a same-sex experience come out of it was the least of their worries right because they, they just really didn't de like you right. said they didn't they develop the characters they couldn't enough. get the character right there was either broken dialogue there were scenes that i mean let's let's face it last jedi completely wasted mm -hmm. two-thirds of the cast mm -hmm. yeah there was literally no point in having finn and poe even show up for the movie right because right what little screen time they did get mm -hmm absolutely had no influence whatsoever on driving right. the story forward. Yeah, yeah. So it was a terrible job mm -hmm. of character development. Having had some kind of more intimate relationship between Poe and, uh, and Finn, and Finn mm -hmm. might have given you a little bit more character development mm -hmm. and would have given you something to work with. Right. But they it, clearly the Disney and the writers and the directors weren't interested in develop, developing those characters at all. Right, right. Um, and part of that has to do with you know as much as Force Awakens was probably the best in the series, mm. but Abrams played too much fan service. Right. You know there was the the whole idea when this whole thing started was it was going to be a handoff of the old guard to the new guard. Mm -hmm. That handoff never really happened. Right. Mm -hmm. The baton was dropped three times during this entire mm -hmm. trilogy. Yeah. Um, and there was too much gravitas mm -hmm. of the original cast to overcome the right. way that they did this. Right. 
uh, where you couldn't make your stars shine like stars in a handoff, mm-hmm. but you never hand it off to them. Right, right. Uh, so that was another thing. And, and JJ started that in the first, you know, episode of this trilogy, and it just went downhill from there. And by mm-hmm. the time we get to Rise of Skywalker, it's a jumbled mess, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and and trying it, to clean it up. Right. It really, it it could have been two movies. You could have done a part one and a part two if you, well, you know. And, and honestly, you could have done episode three so much better if you literally just forgot that episode, the middle episode happened. If mm-hmm. you, if you threw Last Jedi out, right. You, Abrams could have done a better job because he spent a third of the movie trying to retcon the right. stuff that happened Every, in yeah, Last Jedi. Yeah, fix everything. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so, and because of that, and because you're trying to give these big stars a send off, right? You can't highlight your new stars. Like right. everything should have happened in the first one. You should have handed everything off. There should have been the resistance should have started in episode one mm-hmm. or seven or nine or whatever the hell one <laughs> uh, Force Awakens was. It should have started there. Right. All your classic stars should have bowed out at that point and been in time. Like, and the you next guys two go. star the next two movies should have just been your new stars. Right. right. That would have given you your character development. Yeah. And you could have seen more groundbreaking stuff done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and Disney even took heat over what what limited, you know, same sex scene emerged from Last right. Jedi where they cut it out in certain countries. Right, right. And and you know what? Shame on Disney for that. Have the courage to at to least... To stand up for it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So Disney simply doesn't have the courage to do that to begin with. Right. Well, what'll be interesting to see is that obviously Disney is starting to, you know, lean a little bit more towards the representation of the LGBTQ uh, community. So in Thor, uh, Valkyrie is actually coded as bisexual in the two films that she's been appearing in. Um, And now the first openly LGBTQ character might hit the screens in an upcoming MCU film, um, Thor Love and Thunder. There is a character, uh, Sira who is a trans woman who uh, descends from a long line of powerful male angels and is rumored to make an appearance in this new project. So that'll be interesting because if, you know, this character is the first trans character, how is that going to play? You can't just take a whole character out, you know, if this is part of the storyline in, you know, a movie overseas. So that'll be an interesting. Well, and I hope they're doing that. I hope it has legitimacy, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like, so many times a character's, in a movie, a character's sexuality has nothing to do with the story. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you don't call people out as heterosexual because they appear in a movie. Right. If you're going to go down the line that you're going to call that kind of attention to the character, Mm -hmm. I hope it's done in a way where it's relevant to the character. Right. And relevant to the story, Mm -hmm. not just to say, oh, check that box. We did that. Right. Well, and that's the thing is that if this is a a trans woman, it's and it's because, you know, she was descended from male angels and she identifies as female. This is a a totally different. Right. So this would play into it. So that's why I think mm -hmm. that's the direction that you want to go. You don't want to put. Right. Like the the um, the scene in in Rise of Skywalker. Mm -hmm. Like, that was a quick shot. Everyone's celebrating, celebrating. Hug the person you love. Kiss the person you love. Bam, Mm -hmm. we have a same-sex scene. Now, that worked out fine. Right. Because there wasn't a story behind it. It was what you would do spur the moment Mm -hmm. when your team wins. Right. And that works. Mm -hmm. So they didn't alter the storyline to include that. Right. Whereas this one, you kind of have to, but do it in a meaningful way where you're doing it to drive the story not to drive the agenda. Yeah. So that's that's my point. Mm-hmm. So um, Disney's getting sued. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> Let's hear about well, that. Well, it's one. Disney and Pixar are actually getting sued over a unicorn adorned van. Uh, so an artist named Sweet Cecile Danier on Monday sued Disney, Pixar, and Onward uh, producer. 
Corey Ray for allegedly conspiring to secretly create an animated doppelganger of her one of a kind van without permission. Wow. Why would Disney ever do that? Because they <laughs> crack down on other people for doing it to their own properties. Right. So she calls it the Vanicorn. And according to her lawsuit, it's the lawsuit of her lifelong love of mythical beasts. At the risk of uh, belaboring the point, the plaintiff has had a real thing for unicorns for a very long time, and they have been a central theme and subject matter of her artistic work throughout her entire career, states the complainant, uh, which is posted in... uh, uh, which had been uh, posted... uh, Dana, Danaher uh, has spent the better part of the last two decades taking pictures of common things that look like unicorns. And in 2014, she published a book of all her photographs called I See Unicorns. Uh, so for the past six years, she's owned a tremendously cool dark blue and purple 1972 uh, Chevrolet G10 van that has, of course, red shag carpet, red velour walls, and uh, seating, and, of course, white shag carpet. If and the van's are rocking, don't come knocking. <laughs> yeah, when you, when you look at this van, you know, and, of course, it has this whole unicorn mural on the side. Now, I will say, when I saw the picture of it, it looked like that typical 1970s van. Like I, I personally didn't see it as like a, a one of a kind. Like it kind of looked like, I don't know, something that I had, had seen before. Um, you know, I don't know. I guess it, it didn't strike me as, Oh my God, that's so unique. I've never seen it type, type thing. It's, it's a very 1970s. Right. Like there's nothing that, you know, so, so anyway, so what had happened was, um, uh, so there was a special event that was actually held at Pixar studios. Um, and they had actually gone to her and said, Hey, can we borrow your van to, to be at this like friends and family event? And it was basically there just as, as a prop. Um, she said the van would basically be used for an event limited to a one day music festival activity day for the employees and families. And that Vanicorn would just be a showpiece, not used in any other way as a, as a prop. So this was like September of 2018. Well, then May of 2019, she discovered that Pixar was producing Onward, a tale of two blue elves trying to, um, reunite um, their dead father who traveled throughout, you know, who traveled around in a vehicle that looked suspiciously like Vanicorn. Um, And then she posted the two vans on Instagram and wrote, wow, hmm, so do you think Pixar Disney stole the Vanicorn for their own movie? So let's let's real quick, just we'll go back to the picture here again for the mm -hmm. viewers. So the top van is hers in real life. Right, right. Which is a unicorn. Mm Mm-hmm. And the bottom van is a shot from the sh- from the film, mm-hmm. which is a Pegasus. Right. They're two different animals. Right. Okay. Right, and obviously the top, sh- her window is a diamond with lightning. lightning coming out of it, and you see the unicorn on water with the you know background of a mountain. Right. And the Pixar's van, like you said, is not only a Pegasus, but it has a moon, and it looks like it's just flying in the air. So, yes, I could totally see her argument that they stole the idea of a purple van. (laughs) And that's about it. Right, because, again... Her van doesn't look... I'm sure if you did a Google search, you could probably find a hundred vans that have a unicorn or a Pegasus on it. I don't want to risk actually sounding like I'm defending Disney here. Right. But this is a frivolous lawsuit. Mm -hmm. This is a woman who's trying to sue a multi-billion dollar corporation under sketchy terms. Right. Right. And is basically trying to get a settlement out of court to get a handout from it. Well, what was funny, though, was that the producer ended up calling her 
and wanting, you know, and basically apologize, saying that they rented her van without disclosing their full intentions or plan and that they were sorry. So, oh, well, that's that's admitting it. Right. right. There. So they basically admitted it. But what they what they kind of go on to say is that at the time, the movie didn't have a actual name to it it was just something that was in the works so there was no way for them to actually write up any contract so there's what, what that what this is is a producer who's probably never going to work for disney again right <clears throat> so so basically they they kind of admitted that they were using it to get an idea but since it was still in the beginning stages there was no way to ask permission because they didn't know what they were doing yeah, well, so. <laughs> he, he learned the hard lesson that you don't make statements to something like that without talking to legal first. Right. So the woman is actually suing for copyright infringement, violation of the Digital uh, Millennium Copyright, Copyright Act, Act uh, violation of the Visual Arts Rights Act, and violation of the California Artist Protection Act, and is obviously seeking damages. So, no, does it say anywhere in here that she actually owns a copyright on the van? Uh, you know what? It didn't mention anything uh, about that. Because so. it's hard to sue for copyright infringement if you don't have a copyright on something. Right. Yeah. And who's to say, and you know. Clearly, pictures of unicorns are not unique right. at this point. Right. So, and obviously, Disney has not yet responded, you know, for uh, for any comments Now, I'm just on waiting this. for Chevrolet to get into the act here and sue right. Disney because they used a Chevrolet They used vehicle. a van, right, yeah. without their permission. So... <sighs> We and shall see. This is what's wrong with this country is you can <laughs> sue literally for anything. Yep, sure can. All right, do I need a transition to go into our Star Wars news? Do you have Star Wars music? I, I don't. We'll just, we'll, we'll just pew, pew, we'll pew, 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 dun, 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 dun. Oh, okay, stop, dun. stop, just, just stop. <sighs> Tell us about Cassie and Andor. <laughs> so now that, you know, the Mandalorian has ended, now everybody's looking forward to the next thing. And obviously, as we reported last week, the Obi-Wan Kenobi show has been put on hold for a little while, you know, even though it's, it's still coming out and everything. Um, but now the new show that everyone's looking forward to is the uh, Rogue One prequel um, that is set to return... Uh, to see the return of Diego Luna's character, Cassian Andor, and Alan Tunick's uh, K2SO. Uh, according to recent reports, the series could premiere as early as next year. Uh, multiple, multiple sources had told them it's safe to assume that the prequel is centered, uh, that centered around Diego, Diego Luna's Cassian Andor will premiere um, in 2021. Um, Luna had actually said that, you know, it was hard when he got the role, um, for Star Wars, knowing that he, you know, basically wasn't going to survive the movie. It, you know, like most people that end up in something Star Wars, it's usually, you know, something that lasts a little longer than, than just one film. So he, uh, was credited as saying, I'm not allowed to talk about it, which is great because I haven't started. I'm just happy, happy to be part of that universe, uh, because I grew up watching those films and having a chance to explore the role in 10 hours or as many hours as you get is going to be great. Uh, it was hard to, start filming knowing that you're going to die so fast. Um, but now we can talk about what happened earlier in Andor's life. Um, so he said, when I saw the, f you know, the first film, uh, the first time I was so disappointed at the end and not because of the film, he said, my son said, but, but that's it, dad. Right? Like, what? <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, you know, that was the thing about the film, even though I knew and I understood, I think at that, that's where, you know, it really got to me. Uh, but now, you know, I realized that the character I loved and the universe I could care, you know, that I, I care about now, obviously, you know, we're ready to, you know, to dive deeper, you know, into it. So it's kind of cool because again, you know, Rogue One, out of all of the newer movies I know is one of our favorites. Right. Um, it was just so well done. So it's nice because again, <laughs> basically almost everybody, you know, except for like Darth Vader and princess Leia who show up at the end, you know, everybody perished uh, for the most part. So it's kind of nice to, 
to see some some well, backstory. And this story. is the Disney formula to continue milking the cow. Well, yeah. To no. make money off of it. So we're going to bring out these characters in a movie. We're going to kill them off. And then we're going to give them prequels. Yeah. Just to keep. Could be, oh, we had a couple of popular characters. We killed them off too soon. <laughs> Let's bring them back and give them a prequel now. They're doing the same thing with Black Widow. Mm-hmm. You know, they're doing the same thing with uh, Wanda, Wanda and Vision. Vision. Right, you know, right. It's like, okay, well, why'd you kill them off? Let's see but how can, their story progresses. I could almost see that with this, it becoming more of a Mandalorian thing where, okay, you kind of know the time frame, but there's going to be all these characters that you didn't know. You know, even though you're going to have, you know, Cassian and... See, and to me, it's poor storytelling, okay? Because if you can have a character that you bring out in a single movie and the fans fall in love with that character then you've done your job of telling that character's Hmm. story if you kill them off. Mm. You don't need to go back and do a solo movie. Right. All right? I don't need to know the backstory to get to that person. You should, you've got two and a half hours in in these movies now to sell me that character. George Lucas was able to do it the first movie with your original stars. Mm -hmm. Why do I need prequels? I don't. Prequels are just to make money. Literally, that is all they're for okay. at this point. Well, this isn't going to make any money because everybody already has their subscription. This is another thing. No, they didn't because they canceled all all of their subscriptions after Mandalorian was over. Well, we so didn't. So this is this is well, you wouldn't let me. If if it was my call, we would have canceled. You didn't pay for it. Exactly, <laughs> which is why we didn't cancel. But my point is, this is the draw Then there wouldn't in. be movie night at 8 o'clock every night. Sweetheart, we own every <laughs> Disney movie. We don't need to stream them. Okay? Whatever. Just that point there. <laughs> but this is to draw people in to sell a service. That's all this is. Okay. So they're going to ruin this character like they've ruined every other character that you saw a prequel of. You know, like Darth Vader. Which they ruined in the original trilogy, but that was Lucas. I can't even blame Disney for that one. Look, the name of the show here is is what is it? It's we're we're calling out Disney, all right? So I'm calling out Disney. I'm just sticking with the theme of the show. Okay. All right. What's our next uh what's our next one here? You got me all flustered. <laughs> Let's talk more Star Wars. Let's, all right, let's talk <laughs> more Star Wars that was Lucas Star Wars and not not Disney right. Star Wars. So, test footage of a canceled Star Wars TV show called Underworld had surfaced on YouTube. The show, which George Lucas apparently wanted to be a hundred episode long, was first discussed after the release of Revenge of the Sith in two thousand and five, but was officially put on hold in two thousand and ten. Due to budget restrictions. Uh, it shows Star Wars as you've never seen it before. Kind of a Blade Runner or Cyberpunk 2077-esque vision of Coruscant. With bright lights, flying cars, an underground resistance movement forming against the Empire. And the citizens going you know, to desperate measures to stop the Empire. Uh, it also kind of reminds you a little bit of Saul Guerrero's fighters in Rogue One. Um, so there's, it's basically a, it's a 10 minute uh, YouTube video, five of it being the test footage and then five of it showing you um, how the story was made. Um, I only watched the first five minutes where you watched the whole thing and basically right. it was all green screen, which is what we kind of, you know, when you look at it, you go, oh yeah, that's, that's yeah, how it, they did it. It looks like Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, it, very Revenge of the Sithy uh, look at it. So it was rumored that 50 to 100 scripts were actually written for this. Um, and, you know, basically in the late 2000s, you know, TV wasn't really ready for a show like this. Um, it was obviously, you know, looks like it was very expensive. And that was kind of before the era of the peak t- television shows, you know, kind of like where we are now. Whereas, um, you know, a budget to do something like that on a weekly basis, they didn't have, you know, the money for. Whereas now, you know, uh, Mandalorian, you know, it's reportedly cost $15 million an episode. Right. So, you know, something like that could be done, you know, today. You know, it was just back then, you know, you had 
then, you know, we have the different writer strikes that went on and, you know, we had the, the start of, you know, the majority of the reality TV oh, and, and stuff. Yeah, right. The dark age of television where now, you know, there's so much good content out there that, you know, you can't really keep up with, with all of it between the streaming services and, and things like that. Um, so this was kind of an interesting look at, you know, where they kind of wanted to to go with with things and you know obviously uh, you know they're probably not going to bring it back but it was a, a neat little you know and right around this time frame was when Lucas Arts was working on the 1313 game which mm-hmm. was uh, supposed to be uh, kind of a bounty hunter style exploring the bowels of Coruscant which would have been very similar in style to this mm-hmm. uh, what was funny watching this though was how cheesy it was. Yes. <laughs> it looked I mean, kind of cool. It looks like it's a know? fan fiction style yes. thing, but I've seen better fan fiction than this. Well, and that's the thing is for when this came out, there wasn't as much fan fiction as like now you do a search for fan fiction and we've watched a couple of different fan fiction things that look like they were produced at a movie studio. Right. You know, now right. everybody has the abilities and can find you know the software and and you know stuff to to make things look very professional so yeah so it was interesting watching this uh it's it's unfortunate that they didn't go this way Mm because i think had they started some of the storytelling that they were going to do in this back then Mm -hmm. a lot of what we have today would make a lot more sense right uh there was a huge gap you know between revenge of the sith and the new hope They've tried to fill that in. There's a huge gap from Revenge of uh, Return of the Jedi to Force Awakens, and they're trying to fill that gap right. too. So, you know, things like this, you know, and even as as much as I don't think they can't say an Andor needs a prequel, I think things like that help you to fill those in. The problem is that they're coming after right. everything. Right. Like it it would have made sense to come out before Rogue One so that this way right. you you felt something for, you know, the character and kind of knew that time frame between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. Absolutely. So tell us about the Star Wars themed basement in <sighs> Los Angeles. Wow. Well, this was an article that was in the Wall Street Journal. And there is a mansion in L.A. that is listed for $26.5 million. The property has a 5,000 foot square foot basement with a massive collection of replica space vehicles and life-size figures from the epic science fiction movies of Star Wars. Um, this was just amazing to to look through so the entertainment complex basement is configured as a museum according to the listing agents uh it contains literally hundreds of -of one-of-a-kind commissions by numerous artists and prop makers including replicas of various star wars space vehicles and more than 40 life-size figures and a number of cartoonish tableaus um from the movies um so the basement, um, basically, you enter through an elevator on the right, and on the left is a Tuscan Raider, um, and then you know, then you see a Jawa, and you know, there's a, a mural depicting Tatooine um, that was painted by an artist who specializes in Star Wars imagery. Uh, then there's the circular display uh, that you can see. Um, that has, you know, 30 of the most common helmets of clone and stormtroopers. Um, and then there's uh, a replica of the speeder bike from Return of the Jedi. Um, there's an X-Wing fighter. Um, then there's a little cantina scene where Greedo is depicted with a pistol in the far right corner. And then there's two other figures. Um, you know, there's a musician from the band. And then, you know, there's one of the characters is drinking a Corona, (laughs) you know, it's just, it's, it's amazing to see. Um, and then they have a theater that's in the back. So if you, you scroll down, um, there's just beautiful pictures uh, of, of the place. I think it's on here. Oh, why did it go on there? Yeah. It's, it's asking me to log in. Oh, that's stinks. Um, well, if you click on the link, um, 
you know, on on uh, on our uh, show notes. Show notes. You'll you'll find it. Um, you know, and and what was interesting too was not only you know obviously he has some very expensive props and and replicas, but then he even has one area where it's um they he had uh, shelving units put in where it's actual action figures still carded. So you know from the most expensive you know, collectible to, you know, something you could get at Target even, you right. know, so it's, you know, where some people just have a collection that's, oh, I only have the expensive stuff, you know, he has, you know, a little bit of everything, um, you know, so he has a little movie theater that obviously resembles the cockpit of a TIE fighter um, and, you know, had the tiles made on the wall, um, the basement, um he actually the the owner of the house had the basement's designer watch the movies to prepare for the project to know exactly how you know he wanted it so again he has the you know the action figures which number in the hundreds he has pez dispensers you know basically a full collection of you know everything in well, and I'm, anything i'm working on reproducing something <laughs> like this in our basement yeah we're we're de- like ours kind of you know <laughs> pales in comparison i'm but, limited on space right we're just... limited on space but for you know it, it's it's definitely you know interesting you know so uh, you know again he has the pez dispensers then you know he actually does have a standing uh darth vader that's in one area um you know it's just amazing when you look through the pictures um you know i I shared it with a friend at work who's also a very big star wars fan and all he could say was how do you clean it all (laughs) i said i said well hopefully for you know 26 26.5 Point five million, you you get the staff. <laughs> if, yeah, if you can afford the mansion, you can afford right, the staff. Right, exactly. So you know, and then just in case you were wondering, the house also includes a music studio, a gym, a tennis court, a safe room, a seven hundred and fifty uh, gallon aquarium, an indoor and outdoor pool and spa area with a grotto, a water slide, and a waterfall. Um, and there's also an observatory with a three acre. Uh, on three acres of grounds, which has um, uh, a telescope as well. So just in case, you know, the Star Wars stuff wasn't enough Just in for case you, you wanted the real thing. Right. Man. You have you have the other stuff. So, again, really <laughs> cool-looking house. So I'll start saving my pennies now. Right. And maybe we could, like, go in with a couple of other people and, you know. There you, did it say whether it was actually George Lucas's house? No, was it wasn't. Okay. Uh, the, the person that was, he was a semi-retired investor who will be hanging on to a few items for sentimental value, but much of the collection is being sold uh, with the house and maybe at an undisclosed uh, amount. So the house itself is 26.5. Not sure how much all the extras nice. will come to. So nice. so that's it for Disney Detective and our Star Wars news. Mm-hmm. And we'll come back with uh, some quick entertainment news. Entertain me, dear. So, really, just, you know, one story, you know, um, came up that, that you know, wanted to bring up. Obviously, we have the Super Bowl that's on tonight, so a lot of different commercials will be on tonight. So, we'll probably have, you know, uh, a recap of, you know, all of that stuff. Obviously, nowadays, a lot of commercials get uh, previewed before the actual game even comes out or part of it does. So, you know, I know I've seen a couple already that, that seemed kind of cute. So again, we'll, we'll talk about that next week, but this one was kind of a little bit of a shock. Uh, so the crown will actually come to an end with season five, um, with Harry Potter actress, uh, Melda, uh, Stoughton officially taking over as Queen Elizabeth in the final season. Netflix announced early this past Friday. Um, Stoughton will succeed Claire Foy, who did seasons one and two, and Olivia Coleman, who is in season three currently and upcoming season four. The series creator, P- uh, Peter Morgan, had initially intended The Crown to run for six seasons. However, he was recently had a change of heart, explaining in a statement, Now that we have begun work on the stories for season five, it has become clear to me that this is a perfect time and place to 
stop. Staunton, uh, meanwhile, said in her own statement, as an actor, it was a joy to see how both Claire Foy and Olivia Coleman brought something special and unique to Peter Morgan's scripts. I am gen- genuinely honored to be joining such an exceptional creative team and to be taking the crown to its conclusion. A veteran of the stage, Staunton played Dolores Umbridge in Harry Potter movies and earned an Oscar nomination for Best Actress in 2004's Vera Drake. Uh, she recently played Lady Maud Bagshaw in the Downton Abbey movie, released, uh, which came out in September, and she's actually married to Downton Abbey star Jim uh, Carter in real life. Um, so The Crown 3 premiered in September. Uh, season 4 will now welcome Gillian Anderson as the Prime Minister uh, Margaret Thatcher and newcomer uh, Emma Corrin as a young Diana Spencer. Um, and that is actually supposed to arrive uh, sometime in 2000 or I'm sorry, season 5 will likely be arriving in 2021. So kind of sad news because that's a show that we really enjoy. It, yeah, it's a very well very made well show. done. So I'm guessing maybe they're gonna kind of speed up the timeline because basically where season three ended was Charles and Camilla meeting. Right, Camilla marrying. So you're mid seventies or so. Right, mid seventies. So now, you know, so it's so season four, you figure, is going to start off with Charles and Diana meeting and right. getting married. And so they're probably going to take that. Maybe season four will end even with Diana maybe not dying. Maybe that's where season five will go. So it'll be interesting yeah. to see, you know, how they kind of speed things up because you figure Margaret Thatcher's going to come into play next season diana comes into play so you're kind you know you're talking early 80s next season's uh, early to mid 80s probably yeah so um, you know it would be nice for it to to finish in that sixth season but i guess you know they're gonna kind of just move it along so well and i think what you're probably going to see is a much smaller time jump between seasons this time than you did last time right and that's true because we did see bigger time jumps you know between season two and season three so so kind of sad but glad that they're at least yeah it's gonna uh, come they to seem a conclusion to have a, right they seem to have a logical <clears throat> point where they're trying to get to and they right. just decided they could get to it with a little faster a, you know one season less than they yeah. needed now i wonder if they're gonna extend the season instead of being like 10 episodes it will be 12 you might yeah you might you see know, that so maybe they'll just do to get that it in there to, and not, not to have to do, do another that. season yeah. so so all right, cool. Okay. So we'll come back with our insightful picks of the week. Mm-hmm. Go for your insightful pick. So last week, my insightful pick was This Is Us. Um, so this week, it was kind of a, a show that I think a lot of people thought was going to be similar to it. And in some ways it is, in some ways it's not. Um, and I know that I, I uh, mentioned it. And it is called Million Little Things, which is on ABC. Um, so the tagline is, uh, it's been said that the friendship isn't one big thing, it's a million little things. This is certainly true for a group of friends from Boston who bonded under unexpected circumstances. Some have achieved success, others are struggling in their careers and relationships, but all of them feel stuck in... Um, but all of them feel stuck in life. After one of them dies unexpectedly, it's just a wake-up call to the others to finally start living. Along the way, they discover that friends may be the one thing that can save them from themselves. Um, so it's it's interesting because it, it's a group of guys that kind of, um, you, you realize they, they, um, they, bonded in an elevator ride uh that the elevator got stuck and you know it was just all four of them happened to be there you know in this office building at the same time and as they talked they realized they were all boston bruin fans and as you know they said hey well i have season tickets you want to get you know you want to go to a game and that was how the friendship started they basically bonded over uh going to boston brewing games and you know, as the time went on, um, one of the, the main guys in the group commits suicide. 
And that's actually how the show kind of starts off and it kind of backtracks and, and you, you know, you never really find out why he did it. It kind of goes forward a little bit, but then you find all these little things that, you know, he was kind of hiding this. And then you have this other friend who has this little dark secret and, and this friend that has dark secrets. And, you know, so as the show goes, it kind of leads you down a road where you think, oh, this is what this is and then some little twist happens where it's not what you expect it to be um so it's one of those you definitely do have to kind of watch it you know in succession um because it has those little you know hints um there was a little bit more last year a little bit more drama to to it where it's not as far-fetched this season and that's where i think with um, you know, where the, there's the parallels of, of This Is Us and Million Little Things because they, they you know, some stuff is in the past and, and whatnot. Um, they never really do future stuff like This Is Us does. Mm. But whereas This Is Us is definitely more family oriented. You know, you have, you know, the one husband and wife that are now looking to adopt, the one husband and wife that were going through a divorce, the the single friend who's, you know, dating all these other people. And then you have, you know, the one husband and wife where the husband, you know, passed away. So there's there's different dynamics, you know, but a good drama if you're, you know, if you're into that kind of thing. Okay. Interesting. Cool pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is, strangely enough, another documentary. <gasps> oh my God, you found another one. <laughs> uh, it is called uh, The Most Unknown. It is a movie on Netflix. The Most Unknown is an epic documentary film that sends nine scientists to extraordinary parts of the world to uncover unexpected answers to some of humanity's biggest questions. How did life begin? What is time? What is consciousness? How much do we really know? By introducing researchers from diverse backgrounds for the first time, then dropping them into new immersive field work they previously hadn't tackled, the film pushes the boundaries of how science storytelling is approached. What emerges is a deeply human trip to the foundations of discovery and a powerful reminder that the unanswered questions are the most crucial ones to pose. Um, this is directed by Emmy nominated and Peabody award winning filmmaker, Ian Cheney, um, and is advised by world renowned filmmaker and, um, uh, Mandalorian alum Werner Herzog. Um, the most unknown is an ambitious look at a side of science never before shown on screen. The film was made possible by a grant from Science Sandbox, a Simmons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone in the process of science. What's interesting about this movie is they take, you follow a chain of, of scientists. So okay. it starts out with this one particular scientist and they introduce this scientist to someone from a completely different field. So you may see a geologist working with an astrophysicist and the astrophysicist goes and lives in the geologist world for a little while. And you see, um, how a scientific brain works really. And, okay. and, and it's, it's very interesting because the, the opposing scientist starts to draw parallels between the two branches of science that they're working with and they can they can sort of start to weave together how these can seemingly disparate forms of science are interacting with each other mm -hmm. so then the scientist who was then playing host goes and becomes the visiting scientist somewhere else mm, okay and it's you know you follow this path of nine different scientists as it goes around and each gets dropped into a completely different realm uh, like in, in one instance, I think it's a, uh, uh, astrobiologist or a, uh, a, a astronomer mm -hmm. and she's diving down, you know, in the Alvin submarine and seeing how 
alien the bottom of the ocean is okay. and comparing it to what she normally works on. Mm -hmm. uh, you have one scientist who's a bacteri bacteriologist, and he's explaining how the various forms of life are categorized in this tree of life. And he circles the different groups that we study. And, and, and when he gets done doing his illustration, the other scientist who happens to be a neuroscientist okay. scientist says, you just drew the brain. He's like, no, I didn't. And and <laughs> then they explain how, yeah, this is really like people don't realize how all these things are connected. Mm. Um, so it's a very interesting look. They don't they don't do incredibly deep dives into any of the scientific principles, but what it is is a very interesting approach to seeing how a scientist who never did did any work in this other field, how the scientific brain it still allows you to jump in there and adapt to that type of work. Um, so it's very interesting to see how things are explained because it's, you're not, even though you may be completely uninitiated from this form of science that you're, you're visiting, they don't explain it to the scientists. Like they're, they're the audience, like they're mm -hmm. a layman. They explain it to them in scientific terms and it's like a whole different language. Mm. Um, and, and seeing how quickly they pick up on, on the various science, ter uh, terminology sets and stuff. It's very interesting to see how they, they interact and the level of respect that they have with each other, uh, was actually very interesting to watch as well. So the most unknown, uh, documentary film on Netflix and we'll come back with, we'll keep pounding these upcoming events. <laughs> Sure. So what do we have for upcoming events? So I figured we'd only touch on, you know, the ones that are, are coming up relatively soon. So next weekend is ZoloCon. ZoloCon. I was waiting for that. So that's February 8th and 9th. Um, and it's the largest comic and toy show in Bucks County. And that is held at the Fugue. Um, and then Monster Mania 45 will be March 13th. Monster Mania. Through the 15th at the Crown Royal. Uh, I'm sorry, not the Crown Royal. <laughs> 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 hey, I just had like a wow. zombie on my head. That was kind of crazy. Um, that would be at the Crown Plaza, Philadelphia, Cherry Hill. Um, again, March 13th through the 15th. And then the Great Philadelphia Comic Con. Why is it great? Because they said so. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> April 3rd through 5th at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks. That was it. That's it? We're not going to go through the other 15 you have nope. there? Nope, 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 nope. All right, we'll keep one going until next week. Going until the beginning of April. All right. Um, so enough. obviously next week we'll be going to ZoloCon. ZoloCon. Uh, we usually go on Sundays to these sorts of things. Um, there's a possibility that someone that is in this room will be doing some cosplay, possibly. Slight possibility, yes. Slight possibility. Um, so obviously we're going to be doing our podcast probably before. Before we go, so we'll have an update about Zoocon. We'll shoot pictures and video of the costume if I wear it. Obviously, so we'll make sure to you know update the following right. week on that one. So we would love to hear from you. Uh, if you would like to email us, you can email comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter at insights underscore things. You could hit us uh, on YouTube to see our videos on youtube.com slash insights into things. On the web at www.insightsintothings.com. You can catch our audio podcast at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. Or on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. That's it. That is it. Another one in the books. Mm -hmm. We're out of here. Peace out.